We are now at part three of lecture 21 of Applied Machine Learning. And in this video, I will talk about another useful tool for diagnosing machine learning model performance called baseline, baselines. Essentially, the idea of baselines is that <coughs> we want to put the results and the performance of our machine learning system in context. As a motivating example, suppose that you have trained a regression model and you have a mean L1 error of 20. Is that good or is that bad? Imagine that you now take your training set and you simply compute the average of all the targets. So you compute the average Y, you compute the average uh, regression target on your training set, and then you create a machine learning model that just outputs this average regardless of what is the input, it just always outputs the average prediction in the data, the average target in the data. If this gives you an error of 20, then our machine learning model has not learned anything. It is not doing better than just predicting the average on every single input. So he, he, we haven't learned anything in that example. But in many other cases, an error of 20 can be a very, very good error. And in order to understand if 20 is good or bad, we need to put this result in context by comparing it to other models. The idea of baselines is to provide such models against which we can compare. So a baseline is typically just another model against which we compare, and usually baselines are simpler toy models, and they provide uh, a basic sanity check on, on whether we're doing well, and they can also help interpret our performance in, uh, in other ways, and they're useful for presenting the results of a machine learning analysis of, or when we're measuring a machine learning system, it is very useful to add baselines to it because it presents additional context along many dimensions. There are many kinds of um, baselines that one can use. Um, something simple as random guessing or outputting constant or average predictions. Uh, something simple like that is very useful because it can provide uh, a simple baseline and often, or, or su I would say sur surprisingly often, the performance of simple and highly naive um, uh, models like these ones can reveal weaknesses about the machine lear learning models that we have trained. Uh, also, it's often useful to compare against simple models such as linear regression or some kind of interpretable tree model. Um, so if, if you're using <clears throat> some kind of very fancy and advanced <clears throat> nonlinear classifier like a neural network, it is often very useful and very important to compare it to a well-tuned linear model. And you may often be surprised that these well-tuned linear models can match the performance of sophisticated, highly nonlinear and uh, state-of-the-art uh, machine learning models that you, that, that, you, that, that you may want to use. Uh, in practice, when you're deploying uh, a machine learning system, you may be working with an earlier machine learning system that was there before you, and in that case, it's useful to compare against that model or if you're running uh, an iterative process and you're trying your next generation, it is always useful to compare against the previous generation. And finally, classical approaches that don't involve any machine learning are also very useful baselines. In fact, machine learning is not the solution to every problem, and it's possible that you're working with a problem in which machine learning is not necessary, and you can implement uh, you can you can code by hand um, a function that involves rules or that involves just standard classical software and programming to solve uh, the, the problem that you're dealing with just as well as with machine learning, but the solution may be significantly simpler and easier to maintain and more stable. And in that case, it can be maybe, maybe machine learning is not the right solution. So comparing to a non-ML baseline is also very good. Baselines can be thought of uh, providing a lower bound on performance that we want to exceed. And it is also useful to uh, 
provide an upper bound on our performance by having some kind of estimate of optimal performance. This is often non-trivial. Uh, often the optimal performance is non-zero, even on tasks uh, such as image recognition or uh, speech recognition, humans are not able to perfectly detect speech, uh, for example, if it's noisy or if there's an accent, and it would be often unreasonable to expect a machine learning model to exceed that performance. So if we have a target for the optimal performance, or for if we have some kind of notion of optimal performance, then this can also help guide our efforts. It can uh, determine whether a model needs to be improved, or it can tell us if we're very far from optimal performance, then it means that we still need to do a lot of work, and so we should reserve more time, more engineering resources for this problem. Uh, so having an upper bound is very useful. There are different ways in which we can estimate this upper bound. Um, if we're doing, if we're solving some kind of classification problem, then we can often annotate the data ourselves. Uh, we can spend some time um, to estimate human performance on a small random subset of the data, or or on our development set, ideally. Uh, and if that is too expensive, there are many ways uh, of doing this using crowdsourcing. Uh, so using a service like Amazon Mechanical Turk can, can be useful here. Uh, and also when we're building a machine learning system, we often have a goal in mind. Uh, perhaps there's some kind of downstream application that we want to use or into which we want to inter integrate. And that downstream application may have uh, certain level expected levels of performance that constitute a goal for us or an upper bound that we are trying to reach. And also by having a notion of optimal error, we can better quantify bias and variance. And in particular, we can break up the bias into avoidable and unavoidable components. Here in this example, I have taken the formula that I had in an earlier slide, and now I also added and subtracted the uh, optimal error, which is our, so our estimate of optimal error. And grouping these terms, I can now uh, group these two in order to uh, define what is called avoidable bias, and which contrasts with unavoidable bias. So the optimal error is the best error that we can achieve and we cannot expect our training error to be better than the uh, optimal error here. Uh, and if our training error is very far from the optimal error, then we still have a lot of bias that is avoidable. Uh, and then the variance definition is the same. And having this breakdown can be useful to, uh, it can make our bias variance analysis more precise. Um, for example, uh, if we have performance which looks like this, our ideal optimal error is 14%, our training set error is 15%, and development is 20%. Well, we have, our bias here is almost ideal, so we should not spend too much effort trying to fix bias. We need to address our variance, which is higher. We may also have an interesting scenario like this one. Uh, suppose that we have a training set error of 5%, and a development set error of 10%, and our ideal error is 7%. So here, we're doing better than the optimal performance on our training set. So we're doing better than human performance on our training set, uh, and our development set error is higher. So this is also actually an instance of a variance problem, because the reason why our performance on the training set is better than optimal is because we are overfitting it. It's because the model is simply memorizing the training set. And therefore, uh, this is again an instance of a variance problem. And finally, if we have something like this, ideal is seven, training is eight, development is nine, even though eight, seven, or nine, that is still far from zero, we know here that we are close to optimal because these are, uh, because these are all, because these numbers are close to our optimal error rate.